In this lesson, we're going to look at the handler func that we created, and we're going to explore why this is set up the way it is and how this maps to a web request. So before I jump into this, it is worth noting that some of these early lessons, and possibly this one more than others, are going to feel like you're drinking from a fire hose. It's going to feel like I'm giving you a lot of information all at once, and you can't necessarily retain it all. That's perfectly normal. Um, I'm not really expecting you to take everything I'm saying right now and to remember or memorize it all. That's not the goal here. I'm trying to explain things in detail in case you're interested or you're curious, or so if you want to watch this lesson in the future to sort of um, you know, summarize everything and to sort of recap what you learned, that's completely fine. But a lot of this is going to sink in as you gradually write more code and use these things. So don't expect to just memorize all this or to learn it all in the first pass. That's, that's not really the best way to learn it, in my opinion. So we saw how web requests work in a previous video or a previous lesson, and we saw that there's basically two main components, the response and the request. And each of these has some unique aspects, like the request might have a URL or an HTTP method that was used, like a get or a post. And we can see those here. Um, if we go to the request, we have a URL and we have a method, and the URL is going to have things like a path and some other stuff we can look at. Um, similarly, the request or the response is going to have some things that might not exist at the request. For example, um, we always will have a body with the response, whereas the request might not. Um, I guess that's technically not true. You don't have to always provide a body, but you can always provide a body. Whereas the request, if you're doing a get request, there will not be a body. There are also differences where the response, you can set cookies and you can set a status code whereas a request is never going to you know, tell the server to set cookies because that wouldn't really make sense. And the request won't have a status code because the server is telling you, know, giving a status code to indicate whether a, a web request was successful or not. And the request itself doesn't need, you know, doesn't need to have that. So in Go, the way we handle any sort of incoming web request is to reflect this reality where there's two things, the request and the response. And this is done with the HTTP.request type and the HTTP.response writer type. So in this case, the request type is the request and the HTTP.response writer is the response object. So the response writer is an interface and it defines a set of methods that we can use to respond to a web request. So that means we can use it to write the response body. We can write headers. We can tell it to, set, we can tell the browser to set cookies whenever we send a response back. Um, we can set HTTP status codes, and we can do all sorts of things like that. Now, one caveat that isn't super important, but I'm going to mention it here just in case somebody runs into this, is that the HTTP status code needs to be the first thing you set if you want to set it to anything other than the default 200 value. And 200 is like just a successful status code. We're going to get into status codes later in the course, but um, by default, 200 just means that everything was okay, everything worked. And that's the one that's just going to be defaulted to. So right here, you'll see that if we don't write anything and we have this, we print to the response writer. If we go back to our code, you'll see that we got a status code of 200 OK. And that's just because Go assumes that if you haven't set a, an explicit status code and it needs to set one, it's going to use 200. And the status code, I believe, needs to be the first thing sent back. So that's why it needs to be the first thing you set here, because if you start writing data, you can't actually write it until it knows the status code. And that means it needs to just decide on one for you. So the HTTP.request um, is not an interface. Instead, it is a pointer to an explicit struct type. And this defines the data for the incoming request, such as the request body, if there is one, um, the path, the HTTP request method. And we can access headers. We can access cookie values. We can read all these things. But we aren't really going to be writing them, um, because this is just information the user sent us. And any changes we, we make to this request are never going to get pushed back to the user. If we want the user to have any sort of uh, response, it needs to be done to the response writer. So you're probably wondering, why is one of these a, an interface, the response writer, and why is the request a pointer to a struct? And I'm guessing the main reason here is that the response writer can now be substituted with multiple implementations. And this allows for different advantages. For instance, different types of connections might allow for different types of responses. Some might be streamable, whereas other responses might be something where you need to write the entire thing and send it all as one big thing. So this sort of gives you some flexibility there. 
Another aspect of this is that um, you can test a little bit easier. So there is the HTTP test package in Go, and this actually has something called a response recorder, which implements the response writer type. And this allows us to pretty easily test our code. We can send a request into this, you know, we can pass a request into this function and pass the response recorder. Here is the response writer part. And we can then check to say, okay, when I ran this function, did it actually set the status code like I expected? Did it write the right body that I expected? We're not actually going to get into testing in this course, but it's useful to know that these sort of things were thought about and these functions are set up so that they're pretty easy to test. So functions that match this definition where they take in a response writer and a request are used quite often because they are the default way to handle any sort of incoming web request in Go. So everything in the HTTP package expects this sort of format for the most part for handling um, web requests. In fact, it's so common that you'll see that inside the HTTP package, there's actually a type defining it. And I'm going to look for it here. It is the handler func. And there are other reasons why this type exists, which we will sort of get into later in the course. But it is worth noting that this handler func type is what we're trying to match here. It is a function that takes in a response writer and a pointer to a request. So that's actually how we came up with the name here, handler func. It could have been named anything. I could have named this home and then changed it down here to be home. And that would have been completely fine. But I just called it handler func for the time being because that's what it's sort of meant to map to. Um, long term, that probably won't make a lot of sense, especially if we have multiple handler functions for different pages um, that are all doing different things. For instance, we might have a home handler, and then we might have like a contact handler. So we might add a second one of these that's meant to handle the contact page. Um, but for now, I'm just going to leave this as is. Inside of this function, there is one line of code. And as I mentioned before, fprint is similar to print, but it allows us to dictate where we're writing to. And while we're here, I just want to take some time to sort of explain why we can pass the response writer into this in case I didn't in the past lesson or in case it wasn't clear. So if we look at fprint, you'll see that it takes in an io.writer and then anything that you're going to write. So if we look at io.writer, this is actually an interface that just has the write method. That's all it needs to have in order to work. And then if we go back to our code and we look at the response writer, you'll see here, um, and again, if you want to see these things, I'm just going to definition. I'm just using a keyboard shortcut to do it. So it would be the same as doing that, right clicking and go to definition. Inside of our response writer, you'll see that this interface also has a write method that is the same as the one in the io.writer. Now the variables aren't named, but that part doesn't actually matter. It still matches the byte slice, int, error parts of it. So if we were to go, uh, I'm in the wrong place, this is what we want. Um, so if we were to go back to this response writer, you would see that this does indeed uh, match io.writer. Um, the reverse isn't true necessarily. Uh, so in this case, io.writer only has the write method. It doesn't have all of the methods of this interface. So io.writer doesn't match the response writer interface. But response writer has every method needed by io.writer. So it implements this interface. And if you're ever looking to understand interfaces a little bit better, I do have um, a crash course on Go interfaces that you can find on my blog. Uh, basically, this is just meant to be an introduction to how interfaces work in Go, and it talks a little bit about some of the pros and cons of different parts of it. Uh, hopefully, it's a little bit useful, and um, it'll help you, you know, understand them a little bit better. I think the plan is to add a couple more articles to this. I don't know if I... I think I wrote some of them already, but I don't know if I posted them on the website. So I'll try to get them up there by the time this, this update launches. Okay, so we can pass this in because it matches the io.writer interface. And then this last bit here, the string that we're writing, is just an HTML string. It's got an h1 tag, which is a header tag in HTML, and we write this all out. Um, normally, we probably wouldn't be writing HTML this way, but I did it this way in the um, you know, just as this basic application because I wanted it simple. I didn't want to have really complicated templates or anything like that when we were just getting started. I just wanted an HTML string there. So that's it for this handler function. Um, what we're going to look at in the next lesson is
the rest of this main function and how all of this takes advantage of this handler function to actually set the server up and get it ready to accept web requests.